Jerofus. Jasper, hi. Hi, Adam. Th uh, thanks for that. Um, I thought I'd just quickly show uh, one thing that uh, we've been doing at Jerofus to help our users. I might do a, I might share my screen if that's all right, uh, Adam. Go ahead. Okay, let me know when you're seeing my screen. Yeah, so I can see it. So if this is our homepage, as you probably know, if you go into support, um, under the ask the community, um, we've been putting uh, out sort of uh, tips and tricks uh, for our users. Um, so that's a, uh, something that we started doing this year. And if you click to each of them, uh, it does come with a bit of a question from either myself or one of the guys in drill first, and we'll try to expl explain the, the how to get uh, do some of the features uh, within Jerofus and what it actually, uh, how, how, how it actually helps you. So this is something that we've done uh, this year. And the way to get to this, I'll just showed you there, but if you have a question you want us to uh, help you with, um, you can actually uh, ask the question. And the way to do that is, let me just go back one more step here, is once you are in here, uh, go to the Q and A uh, tab, and there is a start new topic, and you click into that. You may you may ask you to sign in and whatnot, and yes, um, do sign in and sign up. Otherwise, you're not able to do this. Um, so from here, you post a topic and write your message there. Follow it under Q and A, and click on the I'm not robot and save. Once you get put all of that information in there, we'll get notified and we can answer your question. And for those who don't have a login to this site, when you get onto the support drill first, um, under the sign in tab, you can just click on the sign up. And there are options here for you to either use your uh, email address to sign up, or there are options also to uh, use Google, your Gmail accounts to sign up as well. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. So. Um, do look out for it. We are sharing those tips and tricks on LinkedIn, the social media channel, or Twitter. So if you're on one of those, do look out for that. So that's all from me. Thanks, Adam. Awesome. Thanks, Jasper. Um, and I guess without any um, further ado, I'll um, hand over to um, Christopher Murray from HDR to talk about um, interiors with Jerofus. Excellent. Thank you, um, Adam and Jasper. So. Um, I began my journey with Dorofus some time ago, and I did approximately five years in the trenches of documenting interiors. So largely it was interior finishes and then doors and such alike. So what I found very useful um, was really just maintaining the constant link with Dorofus and Revit and what your documentation was outputting. So really the golden truth has to be Dorofus. Otherwise, at the end of a project, at some point, someone's gonna say, well, where, where's your RDS for validation? And either you spend the time up front whilst you're documenting, maintaining it via the database, or you spend a long time actually uh, updating and making sure it aligns with the PDFs you've exported, which nobody really wants to do in this day and age. So I'm just going to present. First of all, a few things that I, I have gripes with in the, the standard either OzHFG or HI database. So we're constantly furnished with these new databases as a project begins. So this, this is a, an OzHFG version 8. Um, so if I just go into any of the finishes tabs, you can see here that we have these four categories. So each of these four skirting walls, ceilings and cornices and windows, they're all classed as a, a category. So the purpose of those is each of those will furnish Revit with the ability to pass a BIM ID specific to uh, one of those categories. So. Um, even though there's no BIM IDs in this database right now. For example, if this was SKI1, it would be pushing through that into the floor and skirting um, parameter in Revit. But equally, you can see here we've got floors and skirting. So that to me in the beginning was a big note because really what you need is you need one finish in one category and therefore one BIM ID in one Revit parameter. And that makes sense on so many levels because it's so much more controllable. So I've, I've seen a few other people um, come up with some Dynamo scripting to try and make this actually happen on the Revit side. But as you can imagine, sometimes you have kind of inlaid 
vinyl where you've got like a, an additional slip rating and we know that's typically like the secondary whereas your dynamo script won't really right. respect that so um, uh, this is the, the how well we've been modeling in websites sorry could everyone go on mute please okay so the dream which i had was actually creating a um a category per finish so this i think we went all the way up to maybe five finishes per wall and maybe two or three for floor but really you can go as for as many as you like so here's another database that's had the modifications applied to it already so this is our current kind of standard so quite early in the job we will go through and basically update all the uh, the, the the categories first of all we add the new categories and then via excel which i'll show you in a minute we will basically reapply and re-add the finish category to each of the finishes and obviously you need a bit of a human brain to do that to understand you know from the OzHFGs, what is the typical finish and what's most used? And you also use that time maybe to you know, incorporate a few other changes. So um, you can see here, um, there is one addition here that we don't often do, and it's very down, very much down the bottom, the zero quantity finishes. So on this particular database, we've been retaining zero quantity items. Um, and if you guys ever have, a, have that kind of scenario and you're doing this kind of one finish per one finish category, uh, this is helpful because otherwise you still start getting the BIM IDs getting pushed through. So if you've got, you know, if this was an old uh, floor finish or wall finish, uh, it would still be populating that that WAL 28 through to Revit, which you don't really want to see. So how do we get there? So first of all, within the main Dorofus GUI settings, um, items, uh, sub item, no, sorry, uh, category item finishes. So this is where you set them up and usually you can't delete the existing ones until you've removed every instance of it. So you would add the ones that you want to uh, continue working with, uh, potentially move the old ones down to the bottom and then start reapplying them. So the exercise, which uh, a lot of I know the BIM managers here have probably come up with before, um, it's uh, a similar task to this. So really all you're doing is binding together both the template code with the finished category. And all I've got on there is a bit of conditional formatting showing to say where basically when you have a duplicate and you just go and move them across. You can see here's the old cornice and uh, ceiling and cornices. And this, in this instance, this was the new name of the category name. So once it's all done and you get, and you're guaranteed uh, one finish per one uh, category, uh, then you can update uh, Dorofus accordingly. Just just be cautious of any instances where there is actually more than one finish of the same finish in a date uh, in a template, uh, because as we know, there is no um, uh, occurrence ID for templates occurrences. So it's really basing it on the code, the finish item code, and um, that's pretty much it. So that's the first thing. And, and why are we doing this? So um, we found it, within maybe a day, you could actually churn out a rather large set of documents for costing or for kind of like schematic design. So often on a job, this is the sort of colored plans and this is using um, a color scheme through Revit, which is to tell me, to tell the truth, one of my favorite kind of options within Revit um, to just very quickly highlight all the vinyl versus, you know, uh, timber look or carpeted areas uh, to then go ahead for the, uh, the the costings and the QS. So this this can be done equally for the ceiling. So in the, we know in the finishes list we receive we have ceilings and and walls and floors. So this is again the same sort of thing that you're getting out of the the color scheme system in Revit. So as far as the Revit plans, uh, they, they go on a, a bit of a journey themselves. So I can say this this is probably maybe revision one or two, but uh, moving forward, as long as you've got your one, one finish per category and then per Revit parameter, then it has gives you the ability to start tagging your specific finishes. So you can see here, our, we've got um, a feature paint around the ensuite, and this is all coming and it's all being led from the secondary uh, finish that's in the tag. 
So that's kind of the end result, and that's a construction set of documents for our floor and wall finishes plans. Equally the same with um, with the ceilings. So again, I do keep banging on about having everything controlled by Dorofas as much as possible. So uh, that was one step. The next step was uh, the finishes schedule itself. So um, we came up with a way of uh, of capturing uh, within Dorofas all the information. So let me just come here to a particular finish. Yeah, so this is just a test finish that we've set up. So uh, BIM idea, as we know, kind of populates the main architectural code. Within each item, um, we have gone ahead and under description, you've got a little bit of usage here. So extended descriptions, largely unused. Uh, but we always create a new tab here called spec or something similar. And this is where we uh, attach all the product information, supplier and, and maybe specifications to it. And also we have the ability to add an image. So this was just a test example here and the result of a bit of a custom PDF report. Um, so we can see here, so you will probably need a bit of XF designer work here. So I'm not sure if you would either get Dorofus themselves to do this or you'd you'd, uh, you'd venture down the route yourself. But uh, I can just, just show you the result. Always hold down shift when you hit generate, guys. It's another tip for Adam's initial set. How are we doing for time? I'm rattling through. Going well so far, Chris. So here you go. So it's got a bit of a cover sheet on this one. Um, and this is the problem. So Dorofus is excellent at exporting to Excel, but it just can't incorporate images. So the only real option is, is basically mimicking an Excel almost like a tabular format document, which can provide an image. So um, Something we have for, for our kind of internal team when they first start using the, this tool to try and understand how this is all mapped out is uh, is this document where it's gone here. So it's compiling a whole lot of information, both in item properties, even the name of the lowest item group kind of gets pushed through here. Um, uh, extended description is the main spec, so you get the main uh, wealth of information in there. So. Again, it's, it's a bit of an XF design of work, but I would say if you're going to go down the route of uh, uh, Dorofus ruling finishes, then this is probably something that's uh, you know, maybe the last part of the puzzle. OK. So the other sideline to this report was that we were actually able to use it for a few other um, packages. So we also we've got finishes. Uh, but we also have sanitary wear, so we've used exactly the same report and just used it in exactly the same way. Populate the information, the images in Dorofus under the item data and export the custom reports. Um, and this last one's for group one ff &E. So again, it creates a bit of standardization within your documentation and, um, and looks rather smart. Also, it puts the onus down of um, the day-to-day -day updating of these documents to the entire project team and not just on, you know, that poor guy who is Mr. Interior finishes schedule. Um, so the other thought uh, we had was applying joinery finishes. And I guess this this uh, method that I'm just going to show you now is used uh, quite commonly with doors and applying uh, hardware and such like to the doors. Um, I'm just going to bring up a, another database. So I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the terminology of, of subs and parts or parts and subs. Uh, I think the official term that they use in the, the Dorofus wiki is sub items as properties. So it's uh, it's using sub items in a slightly different way. And I'm sure the, the dev team could talk about how, it, how it's intrinsically different in the coding. But uh, we all know that sub items Basically, you put a sub item down and it appears everywhere underneath that item in every occurrence. So the, the smart thing about subs and parts or parts and subs, and I'll just show you exactly where it's kind of initiated and set up is in the sub item categories. So in here, this is where you have the ability to add a particular uh, um, 
property set of subs. And then from that, you'll choose the default um, item group that it allows you to select from. Just bring this database across, if it will let me. That one. So the outcome is um, you're selecting an item, uh, and in this case, it's all joinery. Um, you actually have to uh, trigger the, um, the parts and subs by allocating it here. So the first of all is at the highest item group you want to allocate it, and this gives you the choice of all the parts and subs that you've set up in the previous window. From there, it basically gives you the option to allocate a, a default sub item. So in this window here, so this is our occurrences. Um, I've just gone and added the particular joinery finish, joinery secondary, and joinery tertiary uh, columns, as you can see there, parts and subs. Um, and in this instance, this is the wardrobes that we see in all our kind of inpatient bedrooms. So the joinery finish here, we've nominated as a feature color. Uh, and the reason why I picked this one as a good example is because we did actually have like two wings of the impatient um, floors and one was say green and one was blue. So this lamb 11 was 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 blue. So the default for the entire floor was blue until we went and actually nominated the particular occurrences and changed it to a different color. So you can see here, as soon as you could then go down to the lowest rung of the occurrence, you can see here that the joinery finish has changed to LAM 1 slash 10. So this as an outcome then allows you to produce an Excel report, which is our uh, FFE or joinery schedule. Um, joinery, FFE, joinery, let's find it here. I'll find an example for you. So I'm just trying to dig out an example. I think there's some people still waiting in the lobby as well, by the way. Oh, they just keep coming, Chris. <laughs> um, that's, um, that, that little ding is someone new rocking up each time. Nikki, come on, just join the meeting. Hi, Nikki, welcome aboard. Please remain on mute for the course of the presentation. Thanks. Same goes for you, Gustav. Just for trying to find an active version of this. Yeah, Chris, I think you're one of the first people I've come across, apart from maybe Peter Hawkins at, here at BVN, who's mm -hmm. um, experimented with the parts and subs. Um, I know essentially, so it's, it's like adding an item, like adding a sub item at an occurrence level, isn't it? Correct. Mm. So those familiar with sub items in Dorofus, um, this allows you to create items and then apply them as the sub to the occurrence of the item, not to all the items instantaneously. Here we go. So we actually, in, in the uh, to begin with, we would have a separate FFE schedule and joinery schedule, but recently we've decided because you can do it via subs and parts that you can just have it as a header and combine them all. So I'm just going to export this one so it shouldn't take too long. So previously we used a very complicated um, bit of Excel formula to uh, to take different columns that we'd hidden and actually push the uh, the BIM IDs and that was when we didn't have parts and subs. That's when we were literally using proper sub items because instead of actually having them listed as a separate item you want them really in the same line as the uh, you know the piece of joinery. So this is the uh, the example of the outcome here, and you can see here we've got a column for each of the joinery finishes, 
And there it is Chris, populated. Chris, can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, yeah. On that? yeah. That's better. There you go. So that's our BIM IDs coming through. And um, it's always good to have a, a joinery skirting, by the way, as we know. So I think you can pretty much get away with four different finishes on most things. Uh, and if there's anything more than that, if there's any any particular special joinery, then you, you just document it on the uh, the special joinery drawing. So uh, I have rattled through pretty fast, and I know we were um, thinking there wouldn't be too much time. So um, I'm happy to uh, move on to questions if needed. Just wondering, is there anyone out there who's got any questions for Chris? Hi, it's um, Marnie here. Um, Chris, Marnie, Adam. Hi. hi. Um, I was just wondering, those uh, the finishes items that you showed listing in there by category, are, are you um, are you linking them back to Dreyfus to an object or to a room? So we're we're pushing them all through as as room parameters. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thanks. And then tagging them, and so so all the various tags you would have seen on this yep. on this set of plans, well, they're all room tags. Okay. So they're based because that's the same as what we do. I just I've heard some people trying to use those um, items, finishes items in Dreyfus, and trying to attach them to objects, which I've never understand how you could actually do. But if yeah. you're doing them by room, so basically those tags that you've got there for say the paint colours around the ensuite. Mm -hmm. They're, they're just a room tag that you manually move to the wall that's relevant, yeah? That's it. That's yeah, it. That's okay. a room tag. Yeah. yeah, it's the same as what we would do. I thought there might have been some new advancement that it actually recognised it. It's something something easier, but no, that's cool. Awesome. So, Thank you. So, like, HDR uh, previously, Rice Dordney, were, were Archicad users, and the entire kind of method of documenting Nasty. with uh, these type of tags was coming from Archicad. And we did have like the zone within Archicad had the ability to do this, and it was it was kind of a lot smarter in a way. So uh, whereas you can see here we've got PNT01 slash one PNT08, like really this is a dupl bit of duplicate information because we've got it nominated over here. With Archicad, it's actually possible to drag that particular part of the room tag out, and as soon as it's out of uh, well, as soon as it's being uh, individually assigned, it disappears from the central tag. So the only way to do that in, in Revit is by having a separate tag that basically says, OK, for this tag, we're only want to going to show primary, secondary, or just primary. But the risk that you run there is basically someone could then go and add a, uh, a, a finish in Dorofus, synchronize it up, and, and no one's the wiser. And it just doesn't make its way down to the documentation. So we actually um, decide just to keep all the finishes in there. And predominantly primary and secondary will get you through like 80% of the rooms. And that's why we don't really build our, our tag box out any further. Maybe it's better to show you something which is actually square. Yeah. More questions? Chris, I do have a question about um, this being a omnidirectional workflow. Um, obviously, once you push finishes into your Revit model, um, there shall it stay. You can't pull a room parameter code pushed into Revit back to a Dorofus item list. How do you undertake verification to make sure that what is in the database is matched with what's in Revit? especially if designers, as they're up to do, mm -hmm. want to get in there and start working in the plan. Because yeah. once they see the colours on the plan, and once they see finishes on a plan, they're going to realise, oh, that's wrong. I need to change that. Yeah, something else. yeah. yeah. so um, I think largely it's down to training and, and, and describing the workflow to the team. So really, Dorofus is the one-stop shop for finishes updates. Um, and I know some people come along and say, well, all I want to do is just change this one code, but I have to go and learn how to use Dorofus. I have to go all around the block and, and figure out how this works. But really, I think the um, maintaining the information in the database and being uh, uh, knowing that you have a reliable set of room data sheets every time you press generate, uh, I, th I think it swallows that cost. So maybe you can understand that from, a, from an organizational point of view, but it does, does point as far as training. Yeah, thanks. So just um, 
wanted to kind of see there how you guys might might do that because it's certainly been a bugbear of mine that mm. um you know you can push to that room parameter but bringing it back is quite a significant workaround so if, if you were to scrap item lists for finishes entirely and go back to more of an older workflow of you know kind of room data uh for controlling this and it's totally totally acceptable still um that because you are literally just editing a code and not an item, then I'm sure you could actually hoover that up. So you could actually just flick around your attribute configuration. Um, and I could maybe just, just for, for the people who haven't seen it too much, I do have a version of Revit open here. Mm -hmm. And hit I his... think that could kind of work if Drofus, and I know Drofus is listening, if, if within a dynamic GUI, there was a partition within a lookup to be able to separate a code from the full name. Otherwise, you're trapped with just putting a code mm. in the Rufus PTO1, which can be meaningless to a lot of people. And you do really want that description there, that name to advise you that, ah, oh, this is actually this type of paint and it's this type of color and it's mm. this type of application. Because you really just want to push the code, not the whole kip and caboodle. Yeah, agreed. Mm. But I think this is actually interesting for people to see that actually when you push something from an item list to a room parameter within Revit, um, that these are essentially the options that you are available to you is that you can take that category name and push it in. You can take that category BIM ID and push it in. Um, you can take the um, item number and name and push it in. There is no option to just push the item number. Um, not sure why, couldn't quite work that out when I was also looking at something like this, but it's BIM ID if it's the code that mm -hmm. you want to code, it, it must be BIM ID. But you know, if you don't have BIM ID, it's pretty easy to put it there, even if you're just copying the item number um, from your um, over to the BIM ID field. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Adam. I think um, Chris and the boys need to have a look at that because we do most projects default back to that room data for this same reason, because we need teams to be able to actually do it from Revit and push it back the other way if required. So mm. it'd be great if we could get that simplified. Yeah, yeah so you, know, you guys are doing a conversion. Oh. So do you, do you convert the OzHFG finishes list into a, a room data finishes list? Correct. We yep. just, yeah, yeah, because it's, we've just had, um, like you were saying before, it, it is comes down to training, but usually on a, um, a health project and, you get the people trained and then they move off or they forget what they're doing and deadlines come out two o'clock in the morning, you know, there's the, someone can only use Revit. So it, it has unfortunately defaulted to um, that old way. Mm -hmm. We would like to move on, but until we can find some sort of way to make it a little bit easier and optional, then um, we sort of suck in there at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, we have come across the, the similar problem where they don't want to formalize the design in the database. So they're, they're, they're designing the, in Revit to create a sketch of some sort. And then they're like, oh, no, now 99% of this has been endorsed. We need to move forward. So it's, it's a job of hoovering out, uh, which, as you say, can't be done. Now, Shannon Watson has a great question here about the WV1500 in the room tag. Is that mm -hmm. also a modeled element? And it raises, a, like when I talk about round pegs and square holes, mm -hmm. it's, um, quite often um, we have a single item list um, for finishes and um, half or maybe more of those finishes are dealt with possibly parametrically pushed into the room, such as floor mm -hmm. finishes skirting and even the primary, secondary, tertiary paint finishes. But certainly um, at BBN, we will model wall vinyl and we will model um, corner guards. You know, there are some finishes that we do model and it throws up quite a quandary um, within Revit. Firstly, because in order to run a verification with finishes that you do model, you 
must be able to isolate that category um, within Revit. So to have a category just for finishes is actually a bit of a struggle. Revit does not provide such a category for modeled finishes. Mm. Um, and then you must also, if you want to be able to isolate your category against the responsibility, uh, you may find, especially within a HI project, that you need to create a second interior design responsibility to align with the modeled finishes as opposed to the finishes that are parametrically dealt with. Otherwise, when you run discrepancy reporting, your discrepancy report may be flooded with a discrepancy for the floor finish, which is actually kind of not modeled. And you may kind of think, well, I'll just make my floor finishes not to be modeled, but it's kind of not true. You actually are modeling the floor finish. You are just using a parameter with which to model it. So there is um, kind of a fair bit more that, that Shannon, your question raises. Now, um, Chris, I don't know if you have the same situation where some finishes you do model. So for floors and ceilings, certainly, and it wasn't something I was going to present today, but um, one of our team created an API tool, an add-on for floors and ceilings that kind of bridges the gap between um, item uh, item information that's getting pushed through into a room versus what we're actually modeling. So you're definitely modeling your ceilings and you want you want them to be tagged in some form, especially when it's you know a, a bit of bit of plasterboard bulkhead around the edge of a predominantly tiled ceiling. So um, I'm not sure how much of that I can actually show on screen right here, but um, basically this can handle that too. Like if you've modeled your ceiling and that mm -hmm. ceiling is within the room, and in fact, there might be two ceilings modeled within the room, Dorofus can link and verify with that system family. That's um, you just kind of get into strife in areas like corridors and where a modeled ceiling is likely and they often do, modelled ceilings don't always conform to the extent of the room that is placed, yeah. which will cause false discrepancy. Yeah, so beyond beyond discrepancy checking it, um, what this tool actually offers you is it, it actually uh, creates the ceiling and creates the floor. So basically your job to begin with is actually just getting the information from Dorofus into your Revit room. So once it's there, and obviously it only creates the primary because it would have no clue of whereabouts your secondary finish would be. Um, so then it leaves the, the job of the person who's actually doing it uh, to, to literally just go and validate and check that where all the secondary ones are. And this is an example of the overall outcome of the, the analysis that it runs. So it's basically looking at all the room information um, and comparing it to the modeled element that's in there. Um, and then if needed, it will update or create. So again, that that's probably about as advanced as HDR have gone as far as the, the finishes tools that we've done uh, that connect Dorofus and, and Revit. And obviously a, API works not for everyone. Yeah, it's another workaround. It's another add-on. It's like swallowing a spider to eat the fly and then we yep. swallow a bird to eat the spider. And really, we just want Dorofus to do it. Adam, just on um, your previous comment about the categories and um, and trying to um, validate things, um, it might be worth you um, having a chat to Autodesk because I know currently through Michael Rua they have been uh, requesting, uh, they put out to those uh, beta testers and that what sort of additional categories that people would like in Revit. So oh, yeah. I've put forward a heap of those purely because of Dorofus, because we have the same mm. problem. Mm. Everything goes under generic model or special, special equipment, and this causes us a, a heap of problems when we're trying to validate through Dorofus. So it might be worth putting forward your thoughts on that, because I, I think they're trying to get that out for 2022. Yeah, well, also maybe it's a question for Dorofus and their developers as well to say, well, how can we instead of using just category in Revit, because it's so limiting and such a, like for want of a better word, disaster at times, um, that we could um, use something else in Revit to be able to tell Dorofus what it's looking for in relation to a responsibility. Um, and I don't expect um, Dorofus to answer that now, but um, that's certainly a question that I think um, a lot of people and um, you know would have um, 
you know, would solve a lot of problems for us if we could actually essentially set an attribute configuration um, that uses something other than category within Revit to decide what responsibility to align that with in Dorofas. Um, certainly, though, it is possible to clean out your use of category within Revit um, and our, you know, um, furniture and furniture systems um, are weirdly used categories. Um, generic models, we actually reserve those for model finishes now. Um, but, you know, that's still an ongoing update. Um, and as for specialty equipment, I think a lot of people use specialty equipment for hey, um, model finishes. But it's hard to tell. Awesome. Well, I think um, there's one more question from Rebecca Yu. Mm. Um, Chris, can you show how the joinery finishes one to four applies to drawings, please? Mm, certainly. So as far as your joinery um, drawings and sections to staff stations, an example that I'm going to just pull up now. Um, so the way that they, they, they link through is through that term finish one, finish two somewhere, finish two up here. So that means that obviously you can swap, swap out in the, in the, in the joinery schedule what finish two actually means. So uh, one drawing. Uh, for for several iterations and several um, finish options. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's a good methodology, I think, around um, joinery and using scheduling to control colors. So even if finish one and finish three became the same kind of color, it doesn't matter. Mm. Well, excellent. We've still um, kind of got plenty of people online, but I think we have come to a close today. Um, if anyone else um, has any kind of quick questions, I do see a hand up in like somewhere in there, but no, I think the hand is down. <laughs> and um, like uh, Chris, that's been excellent. Thank you so much for sharing like that experience um, that you've had and actually you know, at the coalface, not just as a database manager, as a Dorofus manager, but actually as um, a documenter too and an interior designer. Um, and that kind of insight is um, really um, invaluable. And hopefully um, for a lot of um, our attendees today, um, that either that's kind of rung true and confirm that, you know, what what you're doing is, oh, that's, that's what we're doing. And um, I think we can still improve that um, and certainly, I am just wanted to kind of, since we've got quite a lot of um, new user group attendees, that uh, the Dorofus APAC user group, you know, we are supported by Dorofus, but we are a user group run by users. Um, myself, Roland Teards, um, Chris Murray, very involved, um, and also um, other um, kind of industry um, professionals that, that run this group. So. The whole idea of it is that, you know, we can make change to Dorofus, we can make change to the way we do things, or we can, you know, agree on things. We can agree on a way to do things that um, Dorofus offers us a lot of opportunities. It's how long's a piece of string, and there's so many ways to do something. But by our collective understanding and collective communication, we can actually agree on the best ways to do things. And um, that way, when we um, move around within the industry, the industry is doing the same thing. Um, now, I guess one question to finish off with is like, it'd be good to know if people would be interested in taking part of a APAC Teams channel um, where we can post questions, we can talk to each other. Um, it would be purely by invitation and your own um, interest in it. Um, so look out for um, an email. It will come from Dorofus uh, to actually um, land in your inbox, um, but it will then come to, to the user group organizing team um, to actually organize that channel where we can, we can meet and chat and raise questions and issues and um, support each other. So thank you again for, for joining. It's been um, hopefully useful to everyone. And 
we'll see you at the next user group, which hopefully will be around June. Um, and where we've got a few topics up in the air, um, but you've got my contact details from the invite. If you have ideas for topics, if there's things you want to see explored, then please let us know. And um, I think we'll definitely be doing some more um, Dorofus inside exploration um, in the future this year as well, because it's been um, clearly well received. Thanks a lot, everyone, and goodbye.